Why don't I start with one uh, fanciful example, and then we can have some questions and maybe do some more examples. People are noticing shoes as we walked in at the beginning, and I came up with this hierarchy of um, of shoes. I'm not sure what methods these classes would have. Uh, perhaps the fasten method, which probably would, you know, if you had some robot controller that uh, that could carry out um, instructions, it would need to know what kind of fastening was on. You know, this was to help, uh, say, uh, people who didn't have use of their hands. Um, then it would have to know what kind of shoe you had. So that would be one reason why you might actually have a class like this, or a class hierarchy like this. And you have uh, a fasten and an unfasten method. Um, and um, so the uh, shoe would be the uh, super class, and it would have. Uh, it would have an, ab, uh, an abstract method fasten. You can't say, give anybody instructions on how to fasten a shoe if you have no idea at all um, what kind of a shoe it is. Um, so uh, the, you would have a method fasten in the, uh, in the shoe superclass, but it would be an abstract method. It wouldn't have any code. It would just tell you that anything that actually is a sh real shoe in the real world must have a way to fasten and unfasten it, even though when we just know that it's a shoe, uh, we don't know anything about what that what that would entail. And then we've got four subclasses, laced shoe. Um, laced shoe actually has two fasten methods, depending on where you learn to tie your shoes, but um, skipping that for the time being. So, uh, you know, laced shoe has a certain method where you take the laces and tie them into a knot, and the buckle shoe has a fastened method, and the Velcro shoe has a fastened method. And then um, unfastened shoe has a uh, fastened method that just doesn't do anything. Um, so these would all have fastened methods. These um, sub-subclasses, such as loafer, slipper, and sneaker, would not have their own fastened methods. You tie a sneaker the same way as you tie any other laced shoe, but they might have other properties that are different. And similarly, these would have other kinds of properties that would, were different, even though the, fa the fastened method they would take from the unfastened shoe. Um, so thanks to those of you who are talking about shoes when we walked in to give me the idea for this set of classes. Are there any... so? Uh, at least now we have something on the board for people to look at, ask questions either about this hierarchy, about objects in general. i got lots more examples coming, too. So. Um, this is something we talked about in class, the super, the call to super. <coughs> right. I beg, they only vaguely know what I'm talking about since I just came. <laughs> <laughs> but it seemed to me, like, if you call, let's say you're doing something in a loafer, <laughs> and, you call, <laughs> and you call super, is it going to go to unfastened shoe, or will it go as far up as shoe? Okay, what will happen, um, let's just uh, think about the constructor event here. Um, so uh, Loafer has a uh, some sort of constructor event uh, where perhaps you tell it what color the loafer is and whether it already has a penny in it. Um, and it takes those parameters and does whatever it needs to do with the things that are particular. Well, actually, it, doesn't, it does that at the end. Uh, what it, you always, in a constructor, you always have to call the constructor on the superclass at the very beginning because you can't do stuff that's particular to a loafer until you have a shoe there at all. So when you call super in loafer, it will run the constructor for unfastened shoe. Now, the very first thing that the constructor for unfastened shoe has to do is call its own super. So in fact, what would happen is the f first it would run the constructor. Well, actually, shoe, the first thing a constructor for shoe is going to do is call the constructor on its superclass, which is object. So first, you're going to run the constructor on object, and then you're going to run the constructor on shoe, then on unfastened shoe, and then on loafer. If you have some other 
method other than a constructor method, you may or may not call the superclass from that method. If you do, then it basically refers to the immediately above superclass. Now, um, let's say that there's some method that's implemented on shoe that's not overridden on unfinished shoe. So it's, it just takes whatever is in the superclass. But for slipper, we do want to override it. So we have some code down here uh, uh, where slipper will do some stuff and it will call super, uh, super dot whatever. And in that case, it will go directly up to shoe because unfinished shoe doesn't have any code. Well, in effect, it will go to unfinished shoe, and when it looks up that method for unfinished shoe, it will say it's not overridden. So it will, it will, the code is actually up here, but it's sort of running it in the context of unfinished shoe, um, and it's just taking it directly since it's not overridden. So if you had a method in shoe that was overridden in the first level down and in the second level down, would you do, uh, use super super to uh, get to something that was in the shoe from? Uh, I suspect that's, I don't know if syntactically you can do that, but it's probably not, I mean, if you're a loafer, you probably don't want to skip over the unfastened uh, shoe. You know, if there's something special about unfastened shoes that you need to do, you probably want to make sure you do it. Um, Uh, also, keep in mind that some t other than constructors, you must call the superclass method. On any other kind of method, you may or may not call the superclass method. For example, the fasten. Well, there, there isn't any code on shoe for fasten, um, but there might be something else. Um, for example, uh, if we have an uh, estimate price um, method on each of these classes, it's probably not going to call the superclass method. A loafer is going to have an expected price that doesn't have anything to do with whether it's an unfastened shoe or a Velcro shoe. It's just, okay, loafers tend to cost about so much and uh, doesn't have anything to do with uh, um, with a superclass. From a design perspective, if you're going to have a fastened method shoe, would it not make more sense to have a, a fastened shoe subclass Uh, yeah, that would be a good idea. Uh, uh, for the sake of the video or anybody who didn't hear, there's a suggestion um, that we split this up separately and we have a fastened shoe uh, subclass and we bring this out. So a fastened shoe and unfastened shoe would both be um, directly uh, subclasses of shoe, and then lace, buckle, and Velcro would be subclasses of fastened, and loafer, slipper, flip-flop, and clog would be subclasses of unfastened shoe. So shoe would not have a fastened method at all, and fastened shoe would have a fastened method that uh, is abstract. This is, by the way, typically what happens on a real project is that uh, you, know, you walk into a room and somebody's talking about something and you start coding. And then um, you know, e even if you actually do the design ahead of time, um, it often ends up happening that when you actually start doing the coding on a big project, you realize that some of your design wasn't really the right way to do it. And you go and shuffle things around um, and do it differently. So it's a good real-world illustration, at least, of the approach. Yeah? Is, is it generally a good idea then to push uh, specific functionality as far down the, the list as possible? Or? It should go where it belongs. Um, if, um, you know, if there's something that's common to all shoes, then it should be up, um, up at the top. Uh, and if there's something like uh, get number in a set, uh, it would probably 
be implemented at the top level, you know, return two. And if you have some other kind of shoe that there's not two of them in a set, then it could possibly get implemented uh, as an overridden method somewhere else. Uh, for example, horseshoe. <laughs> Any other questions about this or about um, objects and inheritance in general before I give some more examples? Okay. Um, the next example I'm going to give is of a what I would call an abstract class, except that abstract class means something specific in Java. So I'm going to call it a non-concrete class. It's not. It's a class that represents uh, something um, that, that does. You know, here we have concrete objects: shoes, loafers, slippers, sneakers, etc. Um, and uh, sometimes it's easiest to see the um, understand the inheritance hierarchy, but they don't tend to be good real-world examples, and sometimes the methods on them are not particularly obvious or useful. So uh, the example I'm going to talk about is operating, specific, operating system specific functionality. And I'm going to talk about the way that uh, some people where I work did it, and then I'm going to talk about the way that they could have done it differently. Um, we have a large product that has that requires a lot of operating system calls to do certain things, um, such as find out what time it is, find out if a particular directory exists, find out how much memory we have on the machine. And the way you do that is going to be different on Windows, uh, sometimes different between Windows 95 and Windows NT and Macintosh and Unix. Maybe it's even different on different flavors of Unix on, a particular, on some particularly obscure thing if you're unlucky. And so the way we currently have it is we have uh, one class that's um, operating system methods, essentially, and a bunch of other classes for operating system methods for Windows, operating system methods for Macintosh, et cetera. Of course, we've only written the Windows ones because our product in practice only runs on Windows. But, but in terms of the design, we have several of these. And um, you call the method on the uh, general one, and it has an if statement that says, if, um, if you're on Windows, call the method on the Windows class. If you're on Macintosh, call the method on the Macintosh class, et cetera. And then on the Windows one, there might be something in there that says, if you're on Windows NT, do it this way. If you're on Windows 95, do it a different way. And that works. Um, but it's not really object-oriented. The object-oriented way is you have a, um, a superclass, an, an abstract superclass that lists all the methods that you would want to do. Uh, such as find out what time it is, find out how much memory you have, et cetera. But it doesn't implement any of them because you never have any way of uh, finding any of this stuff out unless you know what operating system you're on. And then um, you have a bunch of uh, subclasses of that for Windows, Macintosh, Unix. And those subclasses actually would implement all the different methods to provide the information or change the information that you need. And then when the product starts running, it would use whatever mechanism it has to find out which operating system you're running on and actually create the necessary uh, object in one of those subclasses. And then you can just, uh, and that object would just stick around. And you could call the methods on that object, and it would do the right thing. Uh, and you don't have to worry. You don't have to do checking all the time of what operating system you're on. And uh, you end up with much cleaner code. Um, it also means that all the objects don't need to be in memory. Um, that's, as, as I mentioned before, less of a consideration. Memory is cheap, but it's still nice to 
to save a little bit of it. So we'd have a hierarchy um, such something like um, uh, OS info. Um, uh, something like this, where um, WinInfo, MacInfo, and UnixInfo would provide implementations um, for all these things. And then if there were a case where Windows 95 and Windows NT were different, then they could override um, <coughs> WinInfo or where Linux or GNU were different from Unix, then they could override it. And um, so you just have one of these objects sitting around, and you call the methods on it, and you get the right answers. Um, and we have some understanding and some blank looks, which is maybe good because <laughs> uh, maybe it means we're actually learning something. Uh, <laughs> um, but so could one of the people with the blank looks try to explain? I'm, I'm not real sure where I'm losing people. So uh, um, or do you just need a minute to think about this? <laughs> um, why don't I write? Um, we have, um, we would have, uh, some specific thing that says something like um, uh, if um, let's suppose Java tells us it's kind enough to tell us um, what operating system we're on. Uh, We have um, <coughs> so we're defining uh, static OS info, OS info object, and we say if system.os equals Windows ninety five, then OS info object equals new win95 info. Um, else, um, if it's equal to Mac, then we set OS info object equal to new Mac info, et cetera. And then later on, we can say um, something like OS info dot get available memory. Uh, so what we do first is we create an OS info um, object that's the right type. And then later on, when we want to get some information, we call um, the method, in this case, get available memory on OS info object. And OS info object is one of these. And so it would run the get available memory method on whichever one of these it actually is. Does that want to be OS info object? Uh, yeah, that wants uh, wants to be OS info object. Thank you. Sometimes with things like this, it's hard to come up with good names for them. <laughs> um, um, Uh, we are we're declaring the type as OS info. Oh, okay. So 
So do, do people understand with, with this example what's going on? And uh, if, it, uh, if at some future time uh, there's a new operating system, then we create a new object over here, change the startup code, and everything else is the same. And the new operating system might be one that is very similar to one of these and would inherit from it, such as Windows 2000 uh, being a subclass of Windows NT. It looks that way. It's basically a convention of naming methods that. So it's not it, a keyword? Really? No, it's not. It's it's part of the name with, without a space. So we assume that a git uh, available memory was defined in the OS info object. Right. It would be defined as an abstract function in OS info and then implemented in the various subclasses. Yeah. I guess I'm a bit confused on what the advantage of defining something as an abstract, uh, an abstract class is over just implementing it in each of the classes where it's needed. Uh, what, what's the point? Of okay. So, supposing we didn't put the method in OS info at all, but we did put it in these, then um, the compiler wouldn't know that these all had it. If you if you said define something as a win info, it would know that win info had available memory, and it would know that Mac info had available memory, but it would think that was a coincidence. It wouldn't know that every OS info, in fact, had an available memory method. And since OS info object is defined as being a member of class OS info, um, the, so so the method the way we've done it. The method is on OS info, and the compiler knows that an OS info object is a member of this class, so the compiler knows that OS info object supports the method get available memory. So it's mainly when you cast it into a class. Um, in, um, yeah, and otherwise, right, otherwise we couldn't do this um, because we've got a compiler that would say that. OS info object uh, doesn't support the method uh, get available memory because OS info object is of this type. So then you'd have to rewrite the code so that um, would that know that instead of Right. You bit, I mean, if you did it that way, you'd lose the advantage. I mean, th that's the basic idea of, of polymorphism is that when you write something like this, you don't really care whether OS info object is in fact a Win info, a Mac info, or a Unix info. You just want to find out how much memory it has. Is, is there any requirement then that uh, if it's abstracted up higher, that it actually be implemented lower? You can't. Um, you can't create an instance of a class of an abstract class. So supposing we forgot to. Um, implement one of the functions in one of these things, uh, then the, uh, when the class, suppose we left something out of WinInfo, then when we compiled WinInfo, it would still be considered an abstract class because it has a method that has no code. And then when we tried to do a new on it, we would get a compiler error because it would say that we were trying to create an instance of an abstract class. So you could have a situation where, for example, WinInfo implemented 99% of the methods and was still an abstract class, and there are a couple things that were different that would then be implemented in these two. So these two would be real classes, and this would still be an abstract class. Does that go for subclasses the next level down? It goes down as far as you want to go. I mean, basically, you can, you can have 16 levels of abstract classes and then um, a, uh, a real class, an a instantiable class down at the bottom. Well, I, I guess what I mean is if you just, if there's a, 
an abstract class on the top level, and then a, an actual method for it on the second level, and then there's a third level beneath that. Does that inherit the? the yeah, from yeah. One, once you've got it at any level, then it uh, all the lower levels will inherit that method unless they override it, but they'll never not have it. So when we write a class, what would be the, the, the parents of that? Would that be object? Or if you write a class and you don't say what the parent is, then the parent is object. Which gives you a few things, um, most of which you don't I mean, particularly use. but. Any other questions about the operating system example? Okay. I'm going to talk about these corrections uh, so that I can erase it. <laughs> I'm not going to erase it right away. I'll give you some time, but I, I do want to talk about it so I have the flexibility to erase it later if I want to. Um, in problem five on problem set one, uh, one of the things you're supposed to do dealt with the uh, polynomial x squared minus x plus one. You're supposed to find the roots of that. In fact, there aren't any real roots. And depending on how you write your program, it would fail in, in some way or another that we don't really want it to. So uh, you should look for x squared minus x minus one, which actually does have real roots. In the last problem, problem eight, the method remove max, um, that was clarified that it's supposed to remove the maximum element and return it. Uh, that's the idea behind the queue. You take the uh, maximal element uh, off the queue and return it to the caller to be processed. Uh, so it returns comparable, which is the um, um, the thing. That uh, that was taken off. The in, in the problem set though it says public void comparable remove max, which doesn't make any sense. So you should cross off the word void. It should just be public comparable remove max. <coughs> and uh, it turned out that uh, the um, the problem set says that there's going to be test classes available for downloading. And when David actually implemented all of that, he discovered that there were actually too many classes and it was a pain. So he put it all together into a tar archive. Uh, so that includes all the actual test classes plus all the support classes that he needed to create um, in order for his test, excuse me, his test classes to run. So you can just uh, download the entire arc, tar archive into your working directory and expand that. And that'll just do that once, and I'll give you all the test classes you need for all the problems in the problem set. Is it okay if I erase this? <laughs> well, we'll get a compiler error because it'll say clog extends unfastened shoe, and Java won't know what an unfastened shoe is. I'll well, just erase it. Uh, um, the next example um, I'm hoping we can uh, come up with together. This is um, an example for a file system. Um, where uh, we have a file system as an object. And uh, it's going to have to deal with the operating system in some yucky ways, which we're not going to worry about. We're just going to talk about the file system class, what subclasses it might have, what other classes it might relate to, its properties and methods. And don't worry about how any of this actually gets implemented, just in terms of thinking about it and what it looks like. For example, uh, one property it would have uh, would be an end. Uh, capacity. 
Um, or maybe I'll, well. Um, so all, all file systems have capacities. In some cases, it's really big. In other cases, it's really small, but they all have some capacity. Um, and um, let's try looking for people to throw out any ideas for methods, properties, subclasses, related classes, and, uh, and see where we get. And if we don't get a lot of suggestions, then I'll put up some more myself. But, but I'll give you guys a chance first. Uh, OK. Um, Um, okay, um, permissions would probably be something at the file level, and we're going to get to the file level in a little bit. Um, okay. Okay. Um, that's probably, might be a string, it might be some other object. Let's assume it's an object. Um, uh, so I, I made location, uh, the type of location, a device, and we're not going to get into the definition of class device. Um, on, uh, on some operating systems, it might work for a device to just be implemented um, as a string, and all devices work the same way. On other operating systems, different kinds of devices work differently, um, and you need to really understand what kind of uh, device it is. Um, so um, the lo um, do people get what I'm talking about? That, um, so we have some other class off somewhere else of, of devices um, that uh, that we can interact with uh, when we need what to. A device? Um, a device could be a hard drive, a CD-ROM, um, could be another file system. For example, we could have a file system that's a um, an archive of some sort. Uh, which behaves like a file system, and it sits on another file system. Okay. In real life, this probably wouldn't really be an array because you can't change the size of an array, but it's going to be easier to talk about if we make an array and you haven't gotten to all the, uh, in, in class yet all the other uh, kinds of collections. So we'll just say that's an array. OK. Um, that's probably a good start. Uh, these are probably all private. They should all be private. I'm just going to save my wrist a little bit and not write private on all of them, actually. That's right. The, de the default is friendly, which basically means anything else in the same package can access it, um, which uh, generally means you, if you're sitting down at, at your computer and writing a bunch of different classes, then they can all access the things. Uh, defined in, in the other classes. So it's a step below public and above protected? Um, right. Although it's not necessarily above protected because you could have a subclass that's in a different package. Um, so the subclass, that subclass could access the protected things, but not the friendly things. 
Okay. Uh, what kind? Uh, what kind of methods? What do we want to have on? Get file, get location. Um, okay, so we'll, we have um, accessor methods for all of these things. Um, what's that? Okay, so. Okay. What do you think about a, um, something like a uh, a change directory? So, supposing we had a, um, would it make sense to have a property that was uh, current directory and a change directory method? <laughs> well. Um, some file systems don't are not hierarchical. So, uh, for example, uh, tape drives are generally not hierarchical. Old floppy disks um, are not hierarchical. So we have um, hierarchical file system extends file system now since directories are files um, well actually let's do it this way directory We'll later find out that directory is a subclass of file. Um, but right now, we're just to define directory, uh, saying current directory is a directory. And uh, we have a get current directory and a set current directory uh, method. We are going to define it, but not yet. Um, so this is going to have uh, its own constructor and accessor and a couple of mutators because we w uh, we want to have a um, um, we probably want to have a change directory where you give it the full path um, and a uh, Probably want to have a few of these. Um, so we have two change directory functions. One we give it a string, and one we give it a directory. Why not? Um, Any other thoughts on things we can put up here? What's that? Make a directory. Okay. Uh, well, um, actually, we don't need make a directory because that's just new directory. We already have that. Um, so uh, um, one of the methods that we didn't, a couple methods that we didn't put up here are <coughs> add file and delete file. So in order to create a directory, we simply do um, file system or file system object dot Add file and 
new directory of whatever the arguments are. And we have our create, create directory uh, without having to actually cre uh, write a create directory method. OK. Um, there is a suggestion that we have a method for create directory, which one still might want to do as a shorthand, but you don't need it because what, what this does, we have a file system object, which is an object of type, actually it's an object of type hierarchical file system, um, dot add file of this. So what this does, it creates a new, we say new directory with some constructor arguments, and that creates a new directory. And um, file system object dot add file invokes this method to add the file. Um, and probably this is going to need to have an additional parameter that says what directory it goes into, um, or at least over here. And, in the uh, hierarchical file system, we need to have um, an add file. Or else maybe add file goes into the current directory one way or the other. Because when we created it, we said new directory. Uh, we haven't defined files or directories yet. This is what normally happens. You sometimes can't compile your code right away because you've got different um, different classes that point to each other. Uh, so we don't actually have something we can compile yet because we haven't defined what a file or a directory is. Uh, so why don't we do that? Uh, let me ask one other thing. Does working on this kind of example and trying to think through it together, does that seem helpful to people in terms of understanding what's going on? Or does it seem more like you're just thinking about file systems? <laughs> OK. Well, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, I'm not getting an answer to that, but I was, I, well, I, I will make the assumption since people are participating that it's useful. Um, and uh, let's just try to get the syntax right here. Yeah, we use the possibility to get the syntax right. I don't know other people. I am just learning that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, is leaving out the private so public so something that we can do when we're writing it? Well, you can. It'll compile, just, and it'll work. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, um, and that. That's more important on a bigger project, um, but uh, let's let's add a private here. Um, and let's make these void. And we'll make these all void. There's no space there. Um, okay.
Yeah. I just think in terms of the, you have the main class as the file system. Yeah. But you're not going to like instantiate that and make a whole bunch of objects that are file systems. Um. Maybe, maybe not. It depends on the on the context. Um, some some classes don't get instantiated at all, such as the math class, uh, which I think only has static methods. Uh, it's got you know the sine function, the cosine function, random function, stuff like that. Uh, this one you actually are gonna. Well, you have two choices. You, uh, you can either instantiate a file system object or you can make everything static if you just handle one file system. But um, you could have an environment where you have a bunch of different file systems. One of the things I mentioned before is you, uh, you can have a archive considered as a file system. It's got a bunch of files in it. Um, and uh, you can get a directory of all the files in the archive, and uh, it would have its own methods. Um, but so that would be a situation where you would have multiple file systems floating around. Or if you considered, uh, say, on a Windows system, the, uh, the A, B, and C director, uh, A, B, and C drives as separate file systems, then you would have. Uh, three file systems all going at the same time. The files themselves is not going to be a class. Yeah, files, yeah. file is going to be a class. It's not going to extend anything here. Right? Uh, no, file is just going to extend object. Okay. Where you can write class file extends object if you want to, but the compiler will assume if you just say class file, then. Uh, yeah. Uh, probably. Well, well, it's a sub. Uh, everything is either directly or indirectly a subclass of the class object, and so um, hierarchical file system is a su also a subclass of file system. So we wrote class hierarchical file system extends file system. Uh, class file system is a direct subclass of class object. We didn't need to write that, but we could have written in here, class file system extends object. And it's functionally the same thing, uh, but the compiler sort of put it in for you, or at least. Uh, there's um, the clone method, which creates a duplicate of something. There's the two-string method, which creates a string representation, which is usually not the representation that you want to use for most objects. Um, there's the get class method, which tells you what class uh, the object is in. There's a half dozen other things that are an object. How is this class file going to relate to these other classes? Um, how is, okay, uh, in file system, we have um, a, a property file list, which is defined as an array of files. Okay. Okay. And we also have, in hierarchical file system, we have the directory, uh, which is going to get defined in a few minutes as a subclass of file. Is it possible to do something the other way around? Like, when you have extend, is it possible to do something, create like a parent somehow? No, you just, if you had something, if you had something, you had something right, if you had something else that you all of a sudden came up with that you wanted to really be the parent of file system, you'd create that and then put here, extends whatever it extends. Right. Because they have to be As, if it's going to, right. Um, how, how and these are all probably going to be public. When we do the file, file list array, um, how does that know that file is a valid type? 
when you compile um, file.java, which is over on this side of the board, it creates a file, file.class. You might have some other non-public classes that are um, that are also in this file. And for each for each class, you're going to get a .class file. And so when we're compiling the file system class, the Java compiler will look, uh, it will see this, and it will look for a file.class file. So that file.class file has to be in the same physical uh, directory as our class file system, or file system.java? Normally, ye normally, yes, but there's, an, uh, there's a way uh, you can put at the beginning of your uh, script, you can say import and give a specification for a bunch of classes, which can then be someplace else. And I don't know how the Java compiler knows where those other classes are, but somehow it does know that. Um, so a, a lot of the uh, standard classes that come with Java, such as uh, the java.util classes, the java.io classes, um, those would be in a separate directory, and you would say import java.io.star, and you get all the I.O. classes. So it could be something that might be helpful. It could be, since there's a lot of confusion about the syntax, if, if before class we got like a, like a handout that all the things kind of written out neatly. Well, I didn't know what it was going to. Maybe we can do that um, uh, before the. Uh, later, yeah, I didn't. I didn't know how this was going to work out because I, I was mostly asking you guys to write it. But uh, yeah, I will. Um, I will try to get this all together. So don't. You can stop copying it down, uh, assuming that I don't run out of Blackboard. Um, and considering I've used only half the Blackboard and more than half the time, that seems likely that I won't finish filling up the Blackboard. So I will get this all written down and uh, make sure it compiles so that I know I don't have any typos um, and uh, post it someplace or give it to somebody who knows how to post it. Um, which is another, let me just give it aside, that's another example of inheritance um, is um, you have um, a, uh, now, let, let, let's suppose, um, no, it's never, never mind that. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. I thought it was going to work. Um, OK, so what are some properties in class file? OK, what's the, uh, what's the data type of file name? We don't need to say file name. We know it's a name because it's in class file. Okay. Yeah, Java has all these different date classes, but we'll just write date. Some files have multiple dates, but we won't worry about that. Depends on the file system. What else? Okay. Um, okay, well, there's type in a couple of senses. Um, the extension, uh, at least in a lot of file systems, is part of the name. And the type in terms of is it a directory, is it an executable, is it something else, we're not going to do as a property. We're going to do it as subclasses, especially since that's the point of this lesson is to do subclasses. So we have public class. Actually, yeah, public class directory. Um,
And you know what we might want to do is get rid of this. Um, so we don't have the file system having a list of files. We have the file system having a root directory, and then the root directory will have a list of files. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, what are some methods you might have on a file. Okay. Um, well, actually, at least the way I'm thinking about it, um, you, uh, you don't actually read and write from a file. You read and write from input streams, um, and uh, and so it's a, it's a sort of different level of operation. I'm not going to get into details about that. I'm just going to say that's we're not, we're not going to do read and write. We're going to take a different approach and have um, I could have kept my arrow, though. Um, we're going to have a, um, a method abstract void and abstract void. So um, we have uh, um, abstract methods, edit and display. You can't really know how you're going to edit or display a file until you know what kind of file it is. But any file is going to have some um, mechanism for editing and displaying the contents. And then in a directory, for example, um, the uh, you would have some program for um, in Windows it's Windows Explorer and my apologies for being Windows centric I don't particularly like it but I'm familiar with it and I'm not uh, and display you know could just be a, a system called LS or something like that. The abstract that you're setting up is probably <coughs> system, is that it? When we s well when we say abstract that means that every actual file is going to have to have some implementation of edit and display. Just like in the, uh, in the shoe example, we had fasten as an abstract method in the fastened shoe class. Um, so that meant that every fastened shoe has to have some way of, of being fastened. Here, every file has some way of being edited and some way of being displayed, but we don't have a generic. So this, this sets it up for inheritance. Then. It sets it up for inheritance, right. So do we need to uh, define file as also an abstract class? Yeah. Yeah, we do need to put that up here. Does that go after class or after public? Or? Uh, it goes before class. And I'm not sure if it matters whether it goes before or after public. So then do we want to, what do we call, because file now we can't create an instance of. Right. So, so does it want to be called file or does it need, because we need a subclass of that that's right. actually a file. Well, this is actually a file, but we're never going to have any objects of that class, but that's okay. We're going to, we may define variables of class file, 
but um, well, like, uh, like, 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 let, let me let me let me uh, put down a couple of other uh, classes. Um, public class uh, text file extends. And text file is not an abstract class. It's just a bunch of text. And uh, you can edit it with Emacs. And you can display it with cat. Um, and I'll also have a binary file, which extends file. And these would call some other um, some other program for editing and displaying them. Now we might have um, some specific type of binary file, like a Java class. So public class Java class file. extends binary file. And um, this would have its own edit and display methods that overrode those for binary file. Any other questions or suggestions on this class hierarchy or corrections? Right. Directory would also uh, um, override edit and display. This is a common construction to have an abstract class and then a bunch of explicit. Things. Yeah. There's another way to do some of these things, which is called interfaces, which you're going to learn about tomorrow. Uh, let's say we wanted to have, I, I'm just going to sort of mention what the problem is uh, because it, it fits into this. Um, but I'm not allowed to tell you what the answer is. Um, the problem is, uh, Let's say we wanted to um, have a execute method. Um, where would we put it? Um, well, Java class file is executable, so we could put an execute method on Java class file. We can't put it on file because not all files are executable. We can't put it on binary file because not even all binary files are executable. Um, so we have Java class file that's executable, and we have a bunch of other kinds of files that are executable, um, you know, ordinary machine language executable files. Um, we have shell scripts that are executable. Um, there are, are a lot of other kinds of things that, that you would consider executable. And they can all have execute methods. Um, but um, let's say we decided, OK, we're going to make uh, executable file as a subclass of binary file. And so Java class file would extend binary file. Except that's not strictly true, because there are some text files, such as shell scripts, that are also executable. Um, so there's no clear way to make up the hierarchy so that you can identify which classes are executable. Um, and the answer is interfaces, and that's what David's going to be talking about tomorrow. <laughs> I told you the name of the answer. <laughs> OK, what do we have here? Um,
Any other? things about uh, about this example or about inheritance and polymorphism in general. Well, I guess let me give a polymorphism example on this. Uh, if you have, uh, let's say you have, um, well, I'll define my variables after I write my code because I'm not sure what they're going to be yet. Uh, and let's see, I was told I was allowed to erase this, and I th so I'm going to do that. Let's suppose we have a get line function in some utility class, so we don't have to worry about all the things we have to do to actually get a line of text from the user. And so that's a string. And well, we could actually, let's do this shortcut so we don't have to do it that way. String file name equals utility to get, dot get line and file some file equals file system object dot that's an additional method that we're going to uh, put in the, um, the file system class is you give it a string and it returns the file object. Um, seems like a useful thing to have. And then we can say file.edit. And we know that Oh, right. Um, I would have written, well, if you write file.edit, then the compiler will complain to you. This is one of the, one of the things about uh, modern programming languages, at least with some programmers, is it, it makes you lazy. You, you write it, you don't pay a whole lot of attention, and the compiler tells you what you did wrong, and you fix it. Uh, um, so that's kind of the way I am up here. I'll let you guys be my compiler and tell me what I did wrong so I can fix it. Um, like I said, I am going to put all this into a document and compile it and make sure it actually does compile before it gets posted. So we know that we can edit any file. We don't necessarily know how we're going to be able to edit the file, uh, but we're going to get this file object back from fso.findfile, and depending on whether that file was a, a, an, actually a member of text file or binary file or Java class file or directory, then it would call the appropriate edit method on whichever one of those classes over there it was actually a member of. And where's the edit method? Uh, directory has an edit method. Um, text file has an edit method, binary file has an edit method, and Java class file has an edit method. And in order to get it to compile, I'm going to actually need to create all those methods. They're not going to actually have any code in them. It's just going to be brace, brace, but that's good enough to implement a method and get it to compile. So none, none of these methods is actually going to have any code on them. Um, uh, and this approach only works if the, like the edit method works on every one of your classes. Right, but we've we've defined uh, in the abstract class file. We've said that edit is a method, an abstract method on the class file, which guarantees that any object. That makes sense. Really. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, it, it guarantees, in, in order to successfully compile it, um, every instantiable subclass of file must have an edit method. Right. Well, if if you define if you don't say abstract on the class, then it has to actually have um, code for all the um, all the abstract methods on the superclass. Um, so, um, if we left out the edit method for uh, binary file, then the Java compiler would say you left out the edit method uh, for this class, you need to define the class as abstract. What you really need to do is write the method, but it will tell you that you need to define the class as abstract. Um, it's not as smart as you are, just pickier. Um, so you go in and, and write, the and write the, that method. Now, in some cases, the method doesn't do anything. In some cases, um, the method might put up an error message. Um, uh, but the method has to actually be there and, and at least have a pair of braces. And it figures, okay, even if you just put in a pair of braces, that at least means you thought about it and decided that that was the right way to do it. And what's the difference between this edit problem and the executable problem? The edit, uh, we decided in our design that every file can be edited. So we were able to put um, edit as a method on the top level superclass file and and we figure okay when we define the subclasses we'll just make sure that all the subclasses have an edit method whereas it's not the case that all files are executable only some of them are executable and the ones that are executable are going to be sort of scattered through the hierarchy of subclasses of file there's not just one subtree of executable and if there were one subtree, then we have that problem with, with something else because it's you know, sort of two different ways to look at files based on what they can do or on how they look. And whichever way you define your hierarchy, you're going to end up with, um, with something that, uh, that doesn't work. So, um, like I said, the answer is interfaces. And um, tomorrow I'll actually show you how we would uh, handle the executable problem in the context of interfaces in this example. Um, how are we doing? People getting it? Polymorphism just applies to these methods, right? It doesn't, it's just limited to that. There's nothing else that's polymorphic. It's just, it's just right. Which is a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay.